This podcast is presented to you by Pastor Derek Armstrong and Word of Grace Community Church. For more information, please visit WOGCC.com. Well, happy Father's Day to everyone. So glad that you're here. Yeah. Round of applause for all the dads. Man, I tell you what, just uh, such a special thing to be a dad. And I'll tell you, when I first uh, got the news that I was going to become a father about 10 years ago, um, I had in my mind how it was going to feel, how it was going to be. And when my son was actually born, it was nothing like that. It was a completely different experience. I had all these ideas of how things were going to go, and it was even better than I had anticipated. And it's just a special, special thing um, to be able to do that. I heard that my kids were going to get me a gift. Um, so uh, I, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, I don't know uh, where my wife is, but make sure it's a good one. Uh, <laughs> glad you're here today. I uh, want to say a special thank you to Pastor Bob Abel, who spoke last week. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Bob. Uh, he's a very dear friend of mine and a friend of this church. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, love Pastor Bob. Uh, you've heard me speak about going up to uh, De Pere to the Abbey for a time of a spiritual retreat before I've shared with you that I've done that a few times with Pastor Andy and other members of the staff. And uh, Pastor Bob was able to go on one of those uh, with us uh, the last time we went, and it was just really enjoyable to have him there with us and just get to know him more and get to bond with him and pray with him and hear his heart. And let me tell you, he has a heart for people. He loves people, and he's called to this area, and he's doing what God's called him to do, and we're glad to partner with him and and honored to be a part of uh, what God's doing through him and uh, Remedy Church there, so I want to thank him for that. Uh, Before I get into the message today, I have a special announcement um, that... This uh, coming week is going to be the launch of 180, uh, which is our uh, teen uh, group here at Word of Grace. It's going to be the 180 Summer Beach Nights, and at 5.30 every Wednesday night throughout the summer, 180 is going to be meeting at North Beach in Sheboygan, where they're going to have a fun time of different activities like volleyball, ultimate frisbee, and things like that. Then at 7.30, they're going to gather around a campfire for s'mores and bible Center discussion and finish up with time of prayer. The summer beach nights um, have been moved up one hour from 5.30 to 8 o'clock instead of 6.30 to 9 o'clock, I think, like Pastor Stephen had mentioned last time. Um, they want to try to make the most of the sunlight. So just make a note of that, parents, if, you have a parent, if you're a parent of teenagers or if uh, you have uh, some kids that uh, you're, you're kind of inviting to that, make sure you make note that it's going to be from 5.30 to 8 o'clock. And this is really important. There are sign-up sheets for email updates for 180, um, especially with things like weather changes and all that stuff. So to get those updates, make sure you sign up. That'll be at guest services. You can do that. And next week, Sunday the 28th, is going to be the kickoff of the Sunday morning junior high classes, where every Sunday morning uh, during both morning services, once worship is over, the junior high, which is 5th through 8th grade, is going to be dismissed to go to their own class where they're going to have a age-appropriate teaching. Uh, we've been praying about this for a while, thinking about this for a while, and wondering when the best time to be able to offer something like that is, because we love our Kids on the Move ministry, um, and we think it's fantastic. But at the same time, we know that uh, we, we can't have kids that are going to be in kindergarten and then all the way up to you know, seventh grade or so in the same room and be able to teach them at the same level because there are different seasons of life. So we've thought about it, prayed about it. We've come up with this plan to be able to offer this um, here as a part of the service. So just make sure that if you have uh, someone who is uh, between the fifth and eighth grade, that, uh, and that could be that they're going into the fifth grade or the eighth grade, that uh, they'll have a special teaching where Pastor Stephen is going to teach them um, after worship in here corporately. Okay? All right. Well, um, I have announced what I was supposed to announce. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's kick off this new series and get into the Word together. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to share your Word to your people. Count it an honor and a privilege. And Lord, I just so greatly, Father, just am excited to be able to open the book of Galatians with our church family, and I pray that they have just been anticipating this as well, and that you have been working on their hearts all the way up to the point where they showed up to church today, and even now as they're sitting in the seats, I pray that our hearts will all be fertile ground that will receive this seed of the Word of God that's going to be planted in us as we go through this book together. I pray that revelation will just ignite in our hearts, that you will show us things, God, that are pertinent and that are uh, relevant to our lives and our situation where we're at, that we will apply the Word and not just be 
be hearers of the word only. I thank you, God, that you are just going to open this thing up to us in such a great way that it's going to impact us. It's going to impact other people around us. It's going to impact the vision and mission of this church and what you've called each and every one of us to do as a part of this church. We love you and thank you for it all in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so if you would, go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Galatians in the first chapter. We're going to go uh, all the way uh, to verse 10 today. Um, So if you're taking notes, the title of this first message in my series on Galatians is called Right With God. Before we get into reading Galatians, however, I want to just give you a quick background of some of the scenario and the scene that's surrounding this book of Galatians. Who was it written to? Who wrote it? What was happening in the world? What was going on? So it will help us to better interpret Scripture because we always, 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 somebody say always. Always. I just didn't want to say it again, but I'll say it again. Always Always. need... (laughs) We always need to read the Bible in context. Amen? Amen. Because if we pull the Bible out of context, men can use their own flesh to distort and, and pervert the original meaning of the text, and we can make it say what we want it to say to serve our own interests. A lot of people do that, but we're not going to do that. That's not how we approach the Bible, where we pick and choose and make our own scrapbook version of the Bible. We're going to look at the scripture holistically in context to make sure that we properly understand what's going on so we can get exactly what God wanted to show us about himself and about the work of Christ in us through this book of Galatians. Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul and he wrote it to the people of Galatia around 49 AD. This is considered one of Paul's earliest writings. This is uh, uh, one of the things that uh, they've said this is going to be one of his earliest things that he wrote, and he wrote it to the people of Galatia. Now, Galatia was not a city necessarily, but rather a group of cities. It was a kind of, you could call a county maybe, a really large county. It was a group of cities in Asia Minor, and it was referred to as Galatia, and it was made up of all these different cities. Um, Paul was directly, throughout this book, and the intent and purpose of his writing, this epistle, was that he was rebuking the doctrine of people who were called Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were people who were teaching that in order to be a Christian, you first must become a Jew and follow the law. And the Judaizers were very much against Paul, and they accused him of making the gospel more attractive to unbelievers by removing the demands of the Old Testament law. That was their chief charge and accusation against Paul. They're saying, oh, you have to follow the law in order to be accepted by God, and you have to keep everything just this way, and you have to trust Jesus as well. So they kind of mixed it all together, and they were teaching this other doctrine, and it had saturated the area of Galatia. And Paul is writing this letter to refute this teaching and this doctrine and help set these people straight. Now, um, Paul writes this epistle to the churches in Galatia to refute that doctrine and to establish the true gospel of Jesus Christ being free grace through faith. This is one of the chief books that the reformer Martin Luther used during the Great Reformation. One of those books that really set him on fire. Matter of fact, Martin Luther was quoted as saying, I am betrothed to the book of Galatians. That's how important that this was to the great reformer Martin Luther. So let's go into the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version this morning. I like the way that it reads. It's real easy to understand. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who were with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but that there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we have been preaching to you, let him be cursed. 
As we have said before, so now we're saying again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So here you see that Paul gives a traditional greeting. He says, hello. He says, we greet you in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But normally, if you look at Paul's other letters, then he will proceed to pray for the people. And he's very lengthy with a lot of his introductions. And that was typical of the writing style of that day. But Paul doesn't do that. He says, hey, it's me and the boys. We're here. Now let's cut to the chase. Paul gets right to the core of what's going on. This letter has almost a very heated tone to it of where Paul is writing from a point of his mind is just, is just racked with, with, with this frustration of the fact that these uh, Judaizers have moved into the area and have begun to teach these things that the people of Galatia are beginning to adopt instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was preached with free grace that Paul originally taught them and established those churches on. Just like Pastor Keith was talking about earlier, that cornerstone, that stone that had been laid of Jesus Christ, here come the Judaizers to start preaching this other stuff, and these guys in Galatia are not deep enough rooted in their belief and in their faith that they hear this other gospel, and they turn away and begin to believe what these other guys are saying. Instead of standing firm on that stone, instead of standing firm on that rock. And Paul says, me and the boys, we're glad uh, to be writing to you. We're doing well. Uh, Now let's cut right to the chase. Who has bewitched you? Who has gotten into your heart? How have you been receiving this other gospel? When we told you this, he said, listen, this gospel is so pure and this gospel is so true that even if an angel comes to you and starts saying something else, don't believe him. He said, if we come back to you and say, oh, we got it wrong because now we're going to teach you this way. He said, don't even listen to us. He said, the gospel is pure. This is the thing that we have built our lives upon is that now we are made right in the eyes of God through Jesus' sacrifice and not through our works. He was so passionate and so adamant about it that he said, if an angel, I mean, come on. If an angel appears to you, you're going to be like, what? What, there's an angel here? And I don't know. I don't know, maybe that angel appears to you and maybe he's got big giant wings like you always imagine. Or maybe like you got a painting of in your home and he's all like, Vroom, let me preach to you another gospel. I need to go, um, excuse me, I don't think so. Amen. That's what Paul was saying. Amen. That's the weight, okay, of what Paul is saying that the gospel brings. Even if that happens, don't listen. Because this is the gospel. Don't let anyone bewitch you. He said, I'm astonished in verse 6 that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you in His grace. That Christ who called you, that you're turning away from that to a different gospel as even if there was a different gospel. So here's really the issue that people were wrestling with during that time is how does one become right with God? How do we know that we're right with God? Why is it important that we know that we're right with God? Some people don't even care. They live their lives like it doesn't matter if I'm right with God. We use terms like make my peace with God. And we think that we can somehow do that in our own strength. And we can't. And Paul was saying you can't make peace with God in your own strength. Someone else had to do it for us. And that's the man, Jesus Christ. You see, how does a person become right with God was the struggle of the day. Because imagine you've been raised in a culture where you've been raised in a very Jewish culture that taught the law, that taught the Torah. But they taught it with their own slant and their own bent because at the core they really misunderstood the purpose of the law. That's why they missed Jesus when when He came and they crucified Him. Because they missed the point of the law. Actually, if they understood the law and the prophets, the way that it was written, instead of making it all about themselves, when Jesus came, they would have said, there's the Messiah. They would have pointed Him out immediately. Because everything in the Scripture pointed to Him. But you see, what man does is man likes to take the things of God and make it all about me. 
And when man takes the things of God and makes it all about us and not about him, we get the focus on us, and then all of a sudden we think this is something that we can do. When man received the law, we see that God was not only trying to give direction for the people of Israel, and not only was he trying to establish morality and things for the people of Israel, but at the same time what he was trying to do was show them his standard. Show them this is how holy I am. And this is how high my standard is. And how the human race, despite their own best efforts, could never measure up to that standard. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law, I came to fulfill it. In other words, he said, I came to show you that I am the standard. Amen. And that you can't save yourself. Jesus had to come and show us that he was the standard. That's what all the sacrifices were about. That was what all the rituals were about. Not that we get married to the ritual and the ritual becomes more sacred than the one we're worshiping. But you see, when we make it all about us, that's what happens. When we make it all about us, we end up becoming just like the Jews of Jesus' day who were the Pharisees who become prideful in how well they kept the law. You see, the Pharisees would pride themselves on how much they could keep the law, how well they could observe all of the holy days, how well they knew to stand up at the right time and speak at the right time and say the right things and the right prayers with the eloquent speech that would impress anybody where people go, wow, those guys know how to pray. Because they would be so impressive. And Jesus said, you see those guys are standing out on the street corners that are disfiguring their faces to let you know that they're fasting. He said, don't be like those people. He said, don't be like those people who stand out in the square and pray loudly so everyone is impressed with how awesome their prayers are. He said, they've already gotten their reward. They were seen by men. That's what Jesus said. So the question of the day is, how does a person become right with God? Because if I grew up Jewish... And I grew up around Jewish people who the primary, uh, primarily the leadership in the Jewish culture had been teaching that it's all about how well you keep the law. And that's how God loves you, is how good you are and how good you perform. And it's very performance-based type teaching and mentality. And then they have been taught their whole lives, this is how you become right with God because these people misinterpreted the scripture and the purpose and the meaning of the law. And then here comes Jesus And Jesus doesn't really change anything. Jesus just shows them what it all meant. And they either repented and came to the truth, or they kept on in their tradition, and they lived a life separated from God, thinking they could earn God's love, favor, and forgiveness through their deeds. You know, it's kind of like this karma thing. Kind of like people think, oh, if I've done bad things, then to offset that, I'm going to do good things, and then good things are going to happen to me. And we take this philosophy that is very me-centered and very very weighted on how well I do, and I go, well, I'll just try to be nice and nice things will happen to me. And if we think that's Christianity, we're missing the point and we're looking at the world through the lens of a Jew without Christ. Amen. We're looking through the world through the lens of, 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 of Christianity like a Judaizer because that's what the Judaizers saw. They saw, well, we need the karma piece, we need to follow the law piece, we need to do all these things. So, yeah, we understand that people who are not natural born Jews can become Christians and follow Christ and can be right with God. But, you know, really, they need to be circumcised, they need to go through all these rituals, they need to learn to do all these things, observe the law, observe all the feasts, observe all these things, because that's, that's also the other part of their salvation. It's almost like salvation through Jesus plus another guy. That's what they were teaching. Not faith in Christ alone, but salvation plus all of this other stuff. That's how you're going to be made right with God. So Paul is trying to say, man, you guys need to understand the gospel because if you understand the gospel, you can understand how you're right with God because one way there is peace, there is joy. One way there is guilt, shame, and condemnation. Because if you live under the letter of the law, you're going to be living a life of shame because you're never going to measure up. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to be good enough to earn God's love. You're never going to be good enough to earn God's favor. But the beauty of the gospel is that you don't have to. Hallelujah. Is that He did it for you. Amen? Amen. It was Jesus Himself all by Himself took your sin, my sin, your shame, my shame, and He nailed it to the tree and it died with Him. He took it to death and then He put death 
to death. And then He raised victoriously for you and for me. Amen? And now... If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. We understand that's how we become right with God. This is what Paul was running around all of the world preaching and sharing and establishing churches based off of. So you could imagine the frustration in the area of Galatia when he receives reports that the Judaizers are out there teaching and instead of them being run out of town for their heresy, they're being accepted and celebrated and people are following their doctrine. You could imagine the frustration of Paul. Imagine the fact that he's going, why would you want to exchange free grace for works? Amen. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? So here's the thing we have to answer. How does a person become right with God? You see, most of the religious world today, I believe, would fall into the category of the Judaizers of Paul's day. Because we now have more technical uh, names for these things. There's one that I really like that I read in a book that was, uh, it was coined in the book Soul Searching by Christian Smith. And it's called Moralistic Therapeutic Deism. Moralistic Therapeutic Deism is probably the marching orders of most people who consider themselves even remotely religious. That's their foundation and their doctrine because Moralistic Therapeutic Deism believes in these things. Believes that there is a God who exists, he created and ordered the world, he watches over human life on earth, and he wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible or, you know, other religions too. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. And God doesn't need to particularly be involved in one's life except when he's needed to resolve a problem. And good people go to heaven when they die. And that's what most of the world who considers themselves remotely religious believes. Good people go to heaven when they die. Good people are are people who are nice, who who are fair, and that's what God wants us to do. And God wants the central goal of our lives is for us to be happy. Now, does God want us to be moral? Does God want us to be happy? Yes, absolutely, right? But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is not for it to be all about me, but rather to be about Him and His glory. Hallelujah. So here's my thing, okay? Just roll with me for a minute, okay? Here's my thing. I'm kind of like Paul. When I look at this free grace, when I look at the message of the gospel, and I look at the temperature of the Americanized version of what we call the gospel. Or I look at religion in the world today and I look at the paradigm that has established the view of the world where they have adhered to certain values. And I see moralistic, therapeutic deism. And I think about frozen yogurt. (laughs) Or, as the cool kids call it, fro-yo. We got a Froyo place in Sheboygan County. We used to have two, but the other one ran it out of business because it's bet, in my opinion. It's called Menchie's. You ever been to this wonderland? You ever been to this wonderland of Froyo? It's over by Home Depot. I'm giving them all kinds of free advertisement right now. I am a card carrying member of Menchie's. If I spend enough money at Menchie's, they're going to give me $5 off my Froyo. Got that right. When I go to Menchie's, they have all kinds of flavors. They have one little thing in the middle where if you pick it, you can mix the flavors on either side into a twist. What? And then when you're done, you get to go over to the candy bar. And I don't mean a candy bar. I mean a candy bar. Where there's every kind of candy that you could imagine that has been crushed up that you can scoop and decorate and accentuate and personalize your froyo. And then you would think that would be it, but it's not. It goes another step. And then there's a fruit bar. Where there's all kinds of fruit. And then there's whipped cream. And they got, they got the Nutella. They got chocolate syrup. They got caramel. They got whatever you want. You can put it all over this froyo. But guess what? 
at the core of all of that, it's just frozen yogurt. Doesn't matter what flavor I pick, doesn't matter how I dress it up or decorate it, at the core, it's still fro-yo. You with me? Yo? <laughs> at the core, it's still frozen yogurt. And when I think about moralistic, therapeutic deism, and I think about the viewpoint of the world, and how they just look at Christianity as another flavor of moralism, just another code of ethics that people choose to follow, and maybe it's better, maybe it's not, but let me tell you, Buddhism teaches moralistic ethics. You know what? Islam teaches ethics and morals. When you look at Taoism, you see moralism. Treat your neighbor right. Be kind to one another. Be friendly. Do good things. Don't do bad things. So, if all of these religions are teaching moralism, then they're all in the same camp of this moralistic therapeutic deism. So what makes Christianity different? That's what I want to know. What makes it different than just teaching be nice, do good? There has to be more to Christianity than be nice, do good, or the people who say all roads lead to heaven are right. Because if that's all this is, if that's all we're here to do together, is just to learn how to be nice and to be good, and to be moralistic, then we're just moralistic, therapeutic deists. The difference is Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. It's not about how good I am, how nice I am. Those things should flow out of a relationship with Christ, not lead me to a relationship with Christ. Because it's the kindness of God that leads me to repentance when I realize that I am a mess and I need a Savior. Not I've been good, I deserve a gold star. When I realize it's all about Him, then all of a sudden He becomes glorious and I become the one who has been humbled to realize I need Him. Not that He's lonely and He needs me. I need Him. Do we think that Jesus is somehow insufficient in the, in the relational category that He needs us? He doesn't need us. We get to be a part of His family because He loves us. Hallelujah. Not because He needs us. We need Him. Amen. You see, when we do things for God, we're not helping Him out or doing Him a favor. We get to be a part of His grand and glorious plan that is His glory being known in the earth. When we understand that, it takes me out of the driver's seat and it lets Jesus take control of my life. Because it's not about how good I can be, how moralistic I can be, how nice I can be. Because every religion teaches good morals. And we're not just another flavor. Christianity is not simply another flavor of God. Oh, let me say that slow so I can say that some more. Because ain't nobody hearing me up in here today. Listen, I said Christianity is not simply another flavor of God. It's not. You need to understand this. I need to understand this. Because just because the Judaizers were alive and well in Paul's day doesn't mean they've stopped teaching their doctrine. They're teaching that junk still today and people all over the world are buying into it because we want to be saved by our works. Because this faith thing seems too good and too free and it doesn't make sense to us who want to try to control and manipulate other people's lives. Because we're glory hogs. Because we're glory hogs. Because we, we, we want to work hard and train and, 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 and do our, our, our part. And we want, to, we want to receive the glory and stand up on the podium and get the flowers and give the speech. But you see, it's not about me standing up on a podium. It's about me letting Jesus Christ's name be known Hallelujah. throughout the earth. That's it. There is no podium for me. There is no podium for me. That's why I tell you, even though I, I, I'm your pastor, that, that's a position of leadership, but God doesn't love me any more than He loves you. I'm a Christian just like you. My prayers don't get to the throne any faster than yours do. I, I love to pray for you and I want to be here for you, but as a brother in Christ, as your pastor, someone who loves you and cares about you, but God doesn't love me any more than He loves you. 
Because it's not about my position that makes me special with God. It's about Jesus' position and my position is with Him. Hallelujah. It's about me identifying with Christ and saying, okay, it's not about my position, it's about His position and I want to link up with what He did. Because yes. I could never have done what He did. Because while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Christ died for me. He chose me when I was at my worst. He scooped me up from the fires of hell to love me and reveal Himself to me and grip me with His grace and His love and His mercy. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Amen. You see, we don't even fit in the Froyo category. We're not simply another flavor. We're not simply another path to a good moral life because Jesus is the only way to the Father. And His sacrifice is the only way that a man can be right in the eyes of God. And Paul was shocked that the Galatians were turning away from that message. He was shocked. He was shocked. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. You're right there if you, you've been hanging on to Galatians. Ephesians chapter 2, right, right next door neighbor. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. Let's read that again. By grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of your works so that anyone could boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, does God want us to do good works? Does He want us to live moral lives? Absolutely. Yes. But those things come out of me knowing Him. Because it's His goodness. It's His goodness that leads me to want to serve, to lead me to want to give, to lead me to want to, to, want to love my neighbor, not just because I think it's going to earn me some kind of credit that I'm going to use when I need it. Because I don't want to put God in my debt as if I even could. You see, when we realize how big He is and how awesome He is, that's what changes my heart. When the gospel becomes big, when the gospel becomes great, when I begin to see the weight of what He did for me, it changes my heart. But why then? Why are, are these Galatians struggling sometimes like we struggle? Why are these Galatians abandoning the gift of free grace? Because the flesh craves its own glory. The flesh wants its own glory. The flesh wants to believe that salvation or being made right with God comes through my own works. And so it's very appealing to our flesh. You see, along with boasting in our flesh, when I begin to feel like I've accomplished something and I'm doing something, it's all about me and it becomes inward focused. And guess what I do? I, I begin to compare myself to other people. I began to go, I may not be the greatest Christian on the planet, but at least I ain't like oh so-and-so. Y'all done seen what she did. At least I'm not like so-and-so. Man, that guy says he's a Christian. I, I'm, at least I don't do that kind of stuff. I saw them the other day. Would you believe where I saw them? You know what I saw them doing? You know who I saw them with? Man, and that guy says he's a Christian. Man, I'll tell you what. Sure, I'm glad I don't do that kind of stuff. That's the heart of a Judaizer. You hear what I'm saying today? Because then all of a sudden I become the judge. All of a sudden I become the person who's sitting in the seat of judgment. And then people say goofy things like, only God can judge me. Like, that's better? That's like the worst thing you could say. <laughs> only God could judge me. Yeah, I know, right? That's why I'm not even going to try. Amen. Amen. Because His judgment is going to be a lot worse than mine. So my job then is not to be the person who's sitting in the seat of judgment, but rather to be the one who is loving people where they're at, trying to bring them out of that pit that has got a hold of their ankles that is pulling them down, and we want to pull them up. Amen. That's what we're supposed to do. Amen. We're supposed to show the grace and love that came to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Not now I'm elevated and, oh, you need to figure out your life. So. And I'm just not going to deal with you. No, I'm going to love you right where you're at. That's what Jesus did. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus loved me right where I was at. And it doesn't make sense to me because I, I come from this work-based teaching and growing up in culture, knowing that I want to stand on the platform with the roses and the cheers and everyone celebrating me 
But instead, I, 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 when I realize it's not about me, then all of a sudden now, I don't need to compare myself to others. I'm not a first place Christian and this person next to me is a second place Christian. Teach. Amen. It, 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 it's not that I, I, I'm a pastor and, and you're a lowly lay person. It's not that, Pastor Derek, I'm a Christian. You are a Christian. We are both on this journey together. Amen. I've been given the responsibility and the authority to teach the Word of God because He's called me. But you also have a calling that is just as weighty. Amen. You have a calling that's just as weighty to be a discipler, to be someone who may have evangelistic gifts or someone who may have gifts of help, gifts of, of, of mercy. Whatever God has put in you, it is to serve His glory and His kingdom. And it's not this stair-step thing just because somebody gets to stand on stage and wear this weird little thing around their ear that makes them more special than other people. We've got to get over this, okay? We've got to get over this. And we need to be about the Father's business Hallelujah. instead of comparing ourselves to other people. Amen. Judaizers will compare themselves to other people. And that's what the flesh craving its own glory will do. I'll tell you what else a, a Judaizer will do. It will develop in you a critical spirit where you can't celebrate anything. Or you'll only celebrate certain things, things that you like. You won't celebrate with others and rejoice with others. I remember one time... When I was in Oklahoma, I had read something in the Bible, and I wanted so desperately to go share with my pastor. And I ran to him, and I said, man, I, I read this. I'm so excited that I saw this in the Bible. God just opened my eyes to this. He looked at me, and he said, I've known that for 20 years. And I said, okay, well, that's great. He said, I can't believe you're just now seeing that. He said, honey, come here. Brings his wife over. He says, honey, he said, he's never seen this in Scripture before. And he began, she looked at me and said, what? You didn't know that? Oh, my gosh. I'm beginning to think, man, I'm not as good of a Christian as they are. I don't know as much as they do. Listen, I don't care if somebody comes up to you and says, I just found John 3.16 and I've never read the scripture before and it changed my life. You celebrate with them, high five them, Hallelujah. and you celebrate because we're not That's criticizing right. where we're at versus where someone else is at. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not criticizing the fact that I can pray louder than you or use bigger words than you. No, we're all accepted by Christ and we need to help encourage and spur one another Hallelujah. on to good works instead of criticize and put one another down. We're to encourage one another, lift one another up. See, this is what Paul is, 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 this is why he's so frustrated, because this is the kind of junk that the teaching of the Judaizers will produce. And this is the kind of junk that if we're not careful, we in the American body of Christ, even us here in Sheboygan Falls and Word of Grace, if we begin to get into this and we miss the gospel, we'll begin thinking along those same lines. Teach. And we need to be careful because... The enemy loves to come in and drive those wedges. The enemy loves to come in and, and try to get people to compare themselves to others or begin to be judgmental or critical in their spirit, not celebrating with other people. You see, here's the thing. <laughs> Along with boasting in our flesh also comes this feeling of security with God based on how well I do. We'll feel superior to others based on what we do or what we don't do. And the reason we do this is because we can become glory hawks. But my Bible reads like this. It said that God's glory is reserved for Him and Him alone. Amen. That's the word. It, it's for Him. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's for Him. It's for Him and Him alone because Christianity is about God getting glory. Amen. That's what it's about. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. You go back and you read the teachings of Jesus. What did He teach over and over again? Every town He went into. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. That was His main message here on earth was the kingdom. Why? Because the kingdom of God is all about God and all about His glory because we are created to show the universe how awesome God is. Amen? Amen? We're the only, the only one out of all of creation that was created in His image. Amen? And the reason He created us is because He wants us to show forth His glory. Not us try to make it all about us. You see, the greatest message in the world is not that I can save myself from judgment by being good enough and following the rules. The greatest message in the world is that while I was in flat out rebellion toward God in my heart, that Jesus took the punishment for the sin of the world so that when God looks upon creation that has rejected Him over and over again, His grace shines brighter than my sin. Hallelujah. That's the greatest message in the world. That Jesus' grace that He gave me as a free gift shines brighter than my rejection of God. Amen. 
because I've received that gift by faith. You see, the greatest message in the world is that Jesus' blood washed my sin away. Hallelujah. And that that act, amen, would melt the hardness of my heart. And that that act would drive me to worship Him and to live a life of holiness that's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That I would want to know Him, that I would want to put Him first in my life because the greatest message in the world has gripped my heart. Hallelujah. This is the message. Listen to me, church. This is the message... <laughs> like Paul said, would change a man's heart from trying to destroy this message to promoting it at the threat and cost of his life. Paul was spending his entire life trying to destroy this message. He spent his entire life trying to destroy this message. And then all of a sudden Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus and he gets knocked off of his horse. And he says, why are you persecuting me? Who are you talking about? I don't know who you are. Who are you? I'm Jesus Christ, the one that you have been persecuted. And it changes his life. That encounter changes his life. Because God said, I'm going to use someone that no one would even consider me using to teach the message of my grace. Because Paul was not only a teacher of grace, he was a recipient of grace. And Paul said, I'm the guy that used to scare the daylights out of Christians before I met Jesus. Because when I rode up into town... They knew something bad was going down. And they would hide. They would run away because they were being killed or they were being arrested and separated from their families. But Paul received the message of the gospel when Jesus met him face to face. And that's the greatest message in the world. One that will change your heart. That's the life-changing power of the gospel. That's why Paul was rebuking the Judaizers teaching his false gospel because he so desperately wanted people to know the truth. It's the same truth that drove Martin Luther to spark the Great Reformation. It's the same trap that the enemy lays before the church today. Same trap he's been laying for centuries. He opens that joker up and he sets it right before our heart. And he lays that trap in front of us. Will you step into judgmentalism? Will you step into comparison? Will you step into a critical spirit? Will you, will you step into gossip? Will you step into backbiting? Will you step into thinking you're more spiritual than someone else because you showed up for prayer meeting and they didn't? Will you step into the trap of judgmentalism because at least you don't do what that coworker does? You might know more of the Bible than me. I know more of the Bible than pastor. And there's a snare for you waiting. I pray more than this person. There's a snare there for you waiting. The snare of the Judaizer. Teach. The snare that Paul was wanting the people to stay away from. Because you see, when the message of the gospel is so great, then I quickly recognize those traps. And I can be like where the Bible says that we're not unaware of Satan's devices. I go, I see that roaring lion going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And he's not going to get me because I'm aware of what he's got Hallelujah. going on. I'm not going to play that game because I see the gospel and the weight of the gospel that has gripped my heart. Hallelujah. Because the only way to be made right with God, the only way to be made right with God is through faith in Jesus. So let me ask you this question this morning. Do you believe that faith in Jesus and grace that he gives is powerful enough to make you right with God? Now, I know the Sunday school answer to that is yes. I know that you know the right answer. You wouldn't be sitting here today if you didn't know the answer to that question was yes. So I know you know that. But I don't want you to give me a quick Sunday school answer. I want you to think about it. Do you believe that faith in Jesus and grace alone that he gives is powerful enough to make you right with God? Think about that. Do I really believe that? Do you believe that grace has made you a new creation because of what Jesus did? Or is it Jesus plus another guy? What is it with you? Is it Jesus and Jesus alone? Or is it Jesus and me makes me right with God? You see, the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. I think I can please God by trying to earn His love. There is no earning of God's love. There is no earning of forgiveness. There is no paying penance. There is no me trying to offset the karma cycle. 
There is no just try to be good and good things will happen to you. No, it's all about Jesus and allowing him to change my heart. And anything good that comes out of me is because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Any following the rules that comes out of my heart is because Jesus has changed my heart. Any treating you nice when you've been ugly to me is because of Jesus. It's not because somebody just told me, why don't you just be nice? No, it's because Jesus has changed my heart. You see, when Jesus begins to change my heart, then all of a sudden His Word becomes alive to me. And when I read things in the Word, I get more out of those things than before. Because before it was just a book of rules, but now it becomes a way of life. Hallelujah. Because I begin to see the life that is in the Word. And that's where the Word of God begins to cut away those things in my heart that are wrong. Because it's that two-edged sword. It begins to cut between the flesh and and the spirit. It begins to cut between the bone and the marrow. It begins to get just razor sharp thin and it's always cutting. It's always changing. It's always helping me to see more and more of how my life can be a testimony to the greatness Hallelujah. of God. Amen? Amen? So Paul's not against good works and morality. I'm not against good works and morality. God wants us to be moral people who are, make good, healthy, God-honoring decisions. And he teaches us that through his Holy Spirit and his word. But no matter how good we become at living a good moral life that can't save us. Because only the shed blood of Jesus Christ Amen. could save us. He took on Himself the punishment that we deserve. Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if we believe with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I don't believe that Paul, who wrote this text in the book of Romans, intended for this to be something that we just do one time and then we go on and just live our life however we want to. I believe that even though I may at one time initially confess with my mouth and, and believe in my heart that God does save me, but I also believe that we are to walk this thing out. Amen? And that my confession gets stronger. And that my belief in my heart gets stronger. Amen? Not just a one-time event where I'm just done with it. But no, now I, I believe this more than ever before. And I'll, I'll speak it more clearly and with more authority and passion. And with more just gut than ever before. Because I believe it. Because it's part of who I am. Not just something I know in my head. So I want to ask you today. Do you believe that faith in Jesus is enough? To make you right with God. Do you believe it's powerful enough? Because the Bible says in Romans 1 and 17 that the just shall live by faith. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Would you bow your head today? If you're here in this place today and you do not know the Lord Jesus. If I could have our, our altar workers go ahead and come up here. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ today. Today is your day. I have people that are strategically placed down front that knew I was going to be speaking a message that was going to talk about this particular topic. And these people knew that, that they are ready to pray with you, to be here for you. Or if you want to pray right there in your seat, I want you to do that. But if you need someone to pray with you, and you're like, I, I, I just need someone to pray with me, come down right now. Don't wait till the end of service. I want you to come right now. I want you to get up right now, make a bold move, take a step, Step out because I believe that the weight of the gospel has gripped my heart today and I need to do something about it and I don't know what to do. I heard a story about a man the other day who said that I kept feeling this drawing. I didn't know what it was. I kept feeling it over and over again. Every time I would come to church and I came for months and I kept feeling this drawing over and over again. And then I finally got up and made that decision. And I didn't even know what the drawing was. I didn't even know what it was on my heart that was gripping my heart. And you may not know what that gripping of your heart is. You may not know what that is, but it's time for you to move. If you're here in this place today and you say, Pastor, I've been a Judaizer. And I see that I've been a Judaizer. Well, what do I do about that then? Repent. It's that simple. It's not hard. Guess what? God's not mad at you if you've been critical or judgmental. God's not going to disassociate Himself with you because of those things. God is wanting you to realize the truth because the truth will set you free. Amen? Amen. And the truth is, is that He has called us to be recipients of His grace, not people who are walking around being critical or angry or, or looking at ourselves as better than other people. And if you've been that person, repent. God, forgive me. 
God, help me to see that truth. Help me, help me to see that truth. Lord, break my heart. Humble my heart today, Lord. Your truth, your word has, has, has gripped me in a way that I feel I need to respond. And if you have any prayer need of any kind here today, you want someone just to touch and agree with you, just to pray with you, to say, Pastor, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I feel someone needs to pray with me today. I, I feel the Holy Spirit doing something in my heart. Maybe you don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. But you feel like you need to respond. You feel like you need to move. Don't just sit there and question that. Respond to it. Step out in faith. Faith is you stepping out when you don't really know what all exactly is going to take place, how you're going to get there. But you just trust in God because you know He's good, because you know He's faithful. And God wants to meet you right where you're at. Man, I feel like we've all been Judaizers at some point in our lives. We may be struggling with that right now. Amen? I've been a Judaizer. I've been someone who strayed away from the teaching of Jesus, the one who gives me that freedom, the one who gives me that love and that truth, the one who is guiding and directing. I know I strayed away from that. And maybe you're like, man, I've strayed away from that. I, 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 I want to just admit that. And, and, and I feel like I've got to tell somebody, help me, Lord, to not walk in the seat of the scornful. Help me not to sit in the seat of the scornful, but help me, Lord, to see people the way you see people. Help me to love people the way you love people. Help me to care about people the way you care about people. Because if we begin to approach the truth of God's Word with that kind of heart, He's going to change us and those around us. Amen, church? Thank you for listening. For more information, please visit wogcc.com.